Okay. Thank you. You're chief of audiovisual. Okay. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, we're going to call the meeting to order tonight. It's just a, little, a minute after seven or so. Um, this is our November meeting for the Eldorado Hills Area Planning Advisory Committee. I'm the chair, John Davey, uh, John Reslier, vice chair here. Um, I'm looking real quick at my panelist list. Um, I don't see Brooke, our secretary, is not with us tonight. And uh, Tim White, our other vice chair, uh, he he's a subject at the uh, CSD meeting tonight in terms of uh, LAPCO representation. So he's going to be voted on at, at that meeting. So Tim's not with us tonight, but he'll watch the recording afterwards. So welcome everyone tonight. Um, we have mostly presentations um, from, from representing uh, Pioneer uh, Community Energy and uh, the uh, housing element update uh, from the county. And we have a few project items at the end, some housekeeping at the end to start that off. But um, when we begin our meetings, uh, let's see, make sure I have the right ones. Um, call the meeting in order, which we just did. And if there's no objection to the agenda. No objection. See, so this is pretty sweet. Um, moving right along. The very first thing we do is we offer an opportunity for public comment uh, for anything that's not our agenda tonight. So if it's not about Pioneer Community Energy or if about the housing element update, um, we'd invite you if you have some public comments or a question, we might not have the answer, but we'd love to hear from you if there's a, an opportunity for you to come up and we'll use this microphone or if you want to grab one of these uh, small microphones on the table, just push it till the green button's on. Okay, this is your chance. So seeing on there, I'm gonna make sure none of our virtual attendees have their hands up and they do not. So with that, we're gonna move along. Um, to begin the meetings, we have an opportunity to hear from Supervisor Heidall uh, about uh, things going on at the county and he provides an update to us um, and we have this chance once a month. And so John, if you'd like to uh, take it away. Sure, yeah, there's three things I wanted to uh, share with you this evening. The first one is redistricting. Everybody knows, I think we did the 2020 census and now the Board of Supervisors is determining what the new boundaries are gonna be for all five districts within El Dorado County. Uh, so the next meeting is November 16th. So it's next Tuesday at 1.30 PM, time, time allocated spot about an hour and a half for public comment on which of four new versions of the maps the two maps that we had is the baselines that people prefer so the baselines in the past were called the city alternative which was probably the least change from the current zoning that were current um, boundaries that we have so it was moving things around a little bit but not a whole lot the other one that was fairly significant that was a baseline was one that was taking and trying to, initial attempt was to divide El Dorado Hills into two equal districts. And that became extremely difficult to make everything work. We were trying to get Cameron Park in the 19,000 population and it just wasn't balancing. So we ended up proposing that the dividing line between district one and district two is Highway 50. So everything on the north side of Highway 50 for the most part stays as district one with some minor changes. And everything on the south side becomes district two because right now as john knows uh, four seasons is in district one half the business park is in district one and the rest of the business park uh, lennar heritage and uh, blackstone are all in district two so what this would do is make that line fairly simple it, it makes it highway 50 and one of the requests that we got back is to look at communities of interest wherein senior retirement communities, 55 and over age restricted, would be considered a community of interest. They have a lot of common interest as opposed to a, a standard neighborhood subdivision that's got a bunch of families and young kids and you know a, a more senior setting where things are typically quieter, less traffic, those kinds of things. So, But those are the two major proposals out there. There's two derivatives of each of those, as I understand it. So there's four new maps to look at. The board is gonna to try to down select to one preferred map out of that. And there may be some minor adjustments to that, but this is pretty much gonna be it, the November 16th meeting. And it'll be brought back to the board. I think it's like December 3rd meeting for finalization. And then everybody know, will know how it came out and uh, it won't change your voting precincts or anything else as I understand it, but you will possibly have different representation. And the thing to note is with existing supervisors who still have a term left to run, as I have three years left in my term, there will be no change in terms of that election. So I will be the district one supervisor for the next three years. 
But in like, for instance, in District 4, where Lori Parlin has served three years, she's got one more year and she's up for election next year. So she would have to get reelected to whatever it is district she's going to be in. If, if it stays as part of District 4, it'd be District 4 she would run for in order to, to continue on the board. If somebody else ran for new boundaries at District 4, for instance, against her, uh, that creates a new competition in those races. So, so that's the first thing I think is the redistricting. We'll get that finished up before the end of the year and be done because we have a December 15th deadline. The second thing that's kind of interesting is the Board of Supervisors unanimously decided to proceed with uh, the plans to build a new Placerville Juvenile Hall. And so about a year and a half ago with the COVID and everything else, we came to the, the, the decision that we couldn't continue to operate two juvenile halls, one in South Lake Tahoe and one in Placerville. So we shut down the one in Placerville. It was the older, uh, less facilitated facility. And so we moved all of the, the juveniles that were in Placerville up to South Lake Tahoe and they've been there ever since. But we've, the, the, the desire was always to move them back to Placerville. And we received $25 million of federal grant monies to build a new juvenile hall in Placerville but the cost since we got one of those, those grant monies, it was about six, seven years ago, has gone up by another $7 million. So the big decision was that we're gonna put $7 million more of either new revenue or general funds into building a new Placerville Juvenile Hall. And the Board of Supervisors said, move forward with it. We think it's that important that we keep our kids here who are struggling with that juvenile delinquency type of stuff in El Dorado County and don't ship them off somewhere else. So. Good news, bad news, but, but that's the, the second major thing that's happening. And then uh, at Tuesday's meeting, the most controversial subject was a proposal that was made by our sheriff to put an encampment right next to the county jail in Placerville to house the homeless. And so the idea was that the intent was to make it consistent with new law, state law that basically says that if you are going to displace homeless people out of public lands, you have to have a qualified shelter to put them in. You can't just push them out without having some place for them to go. Different from private property, right? Private property, law enforcement can come in and say, you don't belong here, but public property. So our public parks, the front of the, the Placerville City Hall, the county grounds, all those kind, those public properties, the homeless can be on anytime they want, roaming around and stuff. They're supposed to be doing no damage, but that, that hardly happens. So the sheriff's proposal was, he thought it would be consistent with state law to be able to build this encampment, put the homeless in tents, have them have access in and out, but provide the food there and services to try to rehabilitate them. So that, that was the, the proposal. It turns out when we looked into the details, because the board unanimously supported the concept, when we looked into the details, five and a half million dollars of funding that our current uh, homeless effort called EDOC, COC, El Dorado Opportunity Knox Continuum of Care, would be uh, basically subject to losing that five and a half million dollars of funding and any future funding. So what they're interested in, this is the federal money. This is federal money and state money, but primarily federal to make sure that when you're spending money on the homeless, that it isn't done in uh, an activity that, that they would consider to be um, uncivil, um, not respective of the homeless, that they have proper shelters, et cetera. So <clears throat> that's where that discussion kind of turned to is, is this still viable or not? And the end result was the board decided that the EDOC COC, the sheriff and our health and human services really needed to work together to figure out how to make this modified hostess proposal compliant with what the federal government, the state government will allow us to keep the monies for, which means it's gotta be more of a permanent shelter as opposed to tents. So there's, you know, versions of, of shelter that you can put together that will do that. They're more expensive, but that's the task that was given to the group to go off and figure it out if they can make all that work. <clears throat> and then in parallel, we're looking at building, actually not building, but buying an encampment that's up in Pollock Pines. It's been used for the homeless during COVID as part of the state program called Project Room Key, where the governor provided money for the most vulnerable homeless uh, associated with COVID risks and stuff to live in 26 hotel rooms and receive training and care. And the success rate was 78% of the people who were in those homeless camps got moved to more permanent housing and now have purposeful lives. 
So that's, that's a huge factor, but you have to understand they were highly screened before they went into that facility, right? So it wasn't your chronic homeless that's decided they're just gonna live out in the woods forever until they die. And so they, they really looked at trying to get people into the program that wanted to better themselves. They had a misfortune in life, give them a hand up, give them good food, give them some, some training if you can and stuff and get them that, that boost to get them to, to more permanent housing and a better life. And that was successful for 78% of the people that went through the hotel. Now the project home key, it's the governor coming back and saying, okay, since that was a success, room key was a success, we're gonna give you money to purchase hotels and motels <clears throat> that would be usable for the same kind of purpose, but it has to be operated for at least 10 years. So the county is now trying to decide if we're going to use that same facility in Pollock Pines that was used for the homeless under room key to purchase it and operate it under home key with more wraparound services. Uh, Volunteers of America would be involved as well as other groups to try to make sure that those homeless that can get elevated to a better life get the care that they need and work through that stuff. So it, it's a tough equation. I'm personally convinced we're never going to eliminate homelessness. We're always going to have homeless people but where people have a desire to better themselves and they just got stuck in a rut for some reason. They're not drug addicts. A lot of them, they're not, uh, you know, alcoholics. They just got stuck in a rut and maybe they, they drink a little bit once in a while or something to kind of relieve the pain, but they are basically people who want to have a purpose in life again. So that's what the program's all about is to try to get those people back on their feet and moving forward. So more discussions will happen on that. It, it's a somewhat contested item because as you might imagine, nobody wants a homeless encampment close to where they are. Even when it's right next to the jail, there's people that live around the jail site that don't want the homeless wandering off the jail site down into their neighborhoods. So, and we have to have respect for all that. So anyway, it's a tough challenge, but we're trying to, to make that stuff work as much as possible. Those are the three items I wanted to share. But. So we're gonna open it up and see if there's questions. Um, I want to jump in because I know John has some good questions, but the, the point of it, we talked about Eldorado Hills being in two districts was that all of Eldorado Hills cannot fit in a district because right. it has to be divided five ways equally. There's way too many people in Eldorado Hills to fit into one district by 39,327, I well, think. 46,000 is the total population of 95,762, and it can only be 38,000 maximum. Yeah, so can't get everyone, but the idea that you would take 400 people from Eldorado Hills and put them in one district, well, then they have no voice 400, 1,000, 4,000, they don't have a big voice in a district with 38,000 people. So that was, I think, the focus. And now John, I know, has some good uh, questions. Thank you. I mean, I have any Thank good you, answers. Dylan. Now, wait, they better be good, though. <laughs> so don't let me down. No, uh, you, have, you, uh, you have three communities. You have Four Seasons. Yep. You have Heritage. So between those two, that's a huge population. Right. And then you have Blackstone. Right. Now, all of these, all of these three communities would like to be considered uh, communities of interest because not only do they share uh, the, the same interests that seniors share, but we share the same streets, we share the same fire department, we share everything. So they have been sending uh, letters to the board saying that on any map, they want to be kept together as communities of interest. As of this point, I haven't seen anything that really recognizes those three communities as being joined together as communities of interest. Okay. So well, the, the one that separates highway, highway 50 is the north-south boundary, takes all three communities you're talking about and puts it in district two. Okay, and, and that's exactly the map that they're looking at. Right. They're looking at the map that divides El Dorado Hills at Highway 50, and they would all be hopefully together in what they would be District 2. Right. Okay, and that's this is really what they're uh, looking for and that they, they really want that they're hoping for. So and that map was one of the, the two baselines that we asked them to do some tweaking to. Supervisor Turnbo um, didn't like the alignment because he felt where he lives in the Somerset area, he was going to lose some of that uh, content, con communities of interest adjacent to where he was. There wasn't Somerset per se, but he wanted to, to wrap around his where he lives a little bit differently and then give up some property on the other end of it that he felt was 
more like District 5. So he wanted to juggle some things, and that's what one of these new maps really kind of shows is his preference of realigning it slightly, right? But yeah, so I, I saw three maps were posted tonight, and as Supervisor Heidel has indicated, there's a fourth map. But I saw three that were posted and shared, I want to say, I had been on the county Twitter feed. But one of them sort of respects what you're talking about, although everything north of White Rock Road is still District 1, yep. which would be uh, Stonebriar. And then two of the other ones weren't exactly what you're looking for, John. So, um, uh, you know, Stonebriar, in, in all reality, uh, it, does not sh it, it does not really share the same interests that the senior communities do and yeah. Blackstone does. And they would really, uh, they really, really would like to see the map that divides it at 50 and that they be kept together as a unit. And we're talking about a huge population. Uh, I think it, they, that was told it was like 10,000 people yeah. in those, that whole area down there. So yeah, it's so significant. You have 10,000 people out of 38,000 people. Now it's, re it's more representative of that community. There's a bigger voice for those residents. So, so we'll, we'll hear all about it next Tuesday. Yep. Um, it's probably an afternoon. 1.30. 1.30. Time allocated. So yep. You can do it via Zoom or you can drive up to Plashville and make your comments now. Or make your uh, comments known in writing in, in advance. So, uh, and you can email the supervisors. It's all on the county website. So with that, I'm gonna open up and see, are there any questions in the room for Supervisor Heidel? Steve, if you could grab one of these microphones so that the online people can hear you, either this one up here, I don't know if that one's on my mind. Either one, Steve, as long as it's green, you're, it Good means evening, go. Steve. Thank you. My name is Steve Ferry and I live in El Dorado Hills. Um, one of the things that we have going on with the homeless issue, and there's lots of conversations going to go on between the next month or two months or six months or whatever, but Lake Tahoe is at risk. I'm dead serious about that. We're thinking of changing the motto from keep Tahoe blue to keep Tahoe brown and bloody. Um, we have roughly 80, I'm guessing at the number, of homeless that have been, that are being taken to Lake Tahoe to live there next to Camp Richardson. There's actually three hotels that 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 the coalition, one in, the one in Heavenly, purchased, yes, and two two oh, over and right. and the two that are on this strip going out to Camp Richardson. Camp Richardson becomes an area that is going to be impacted by these folks, and we have pictures of it being impacted by these folks, where they're using it for a toilet and for their drugs and all that kind of stuff. We have those pictures. I took them off my my cell phone because I thought they were so disgusting that I just didn't want to carry them around with me, period. The point is that we have a homeless issue here and we have some situation, a situation, I think, where the, the sheriff is trying to give us a new way to address homelessness. And the old way has been in, in effect for now 40 years, 50 years. Some of us have gray hair. I have mine on my face. <laughs> but we've seen this homeless issue go on for a long, long time. And there's very few new, new uh, ways to solve that problem. So the sheriff comes up with a new way to solve that problem. I think you ought to be given every piece of, of leeway to get that done. When we spoke last week, I was in here with, with the supervisor and an associate from the high school who's written a really nice report. And uh, I asked him the question is, what are we doing for the homeless or for the mentally ill, do we keep track of what is success in your eyes? And Nicole, who is with that department said, we don't have a, a, a narrative for that. So I asked him, well, what is your success rate from 2010 to 2019, which is the last decade? And they have no record of what their success rate is because they've never determined what success is. And so I, I suggest to the board, to the the, the, well, they can tell you the number of people that have been treated, but they can't tell you success like your bone is healed and you're able to go out and run down the street. <laughs> right. Kind of or you're back to work and you're back with your yeah. family, you're, you're off the drugs, all that kind of stuff, which they have all the data for, but they haven't produced a report for it. And I suggest to the Board of Supervisors <coughs> clearly that they should force the Health and Human Services Division to actually provide the kind of information that we need as a community to decide how we deal with the homeless and to, in the meantime, get behind the sheriff with what he's doing. Thank you for giving me a, a couple of minutes. Uh, Steve, can I, I, can I comment? On sure, what of course. You have to say, you know, I grew up with homeless people. Yeah. Okay. 
And I remember when, back in New York City, to save money, they closed the mental hospitals. They cut them in half. Mm -hmm. They gave the people a bottle of Thorazine and they said, go on your way, okay? <laughs> and these are the people that are running around even till today, pushing people in front of trains, whacking people in the head with, uh, so I think John, when you had that meeting on mental health, yeah. I think uh, many of these people do need, uh, they do need to be in a facility where they're taken care of insofar as their mental health. And you, I think you have to open up uh, facilities instead of closing them the way uh, they try to save money back in uh, in New York. That's you know that's num that's really number one. And uh, and I'm also thinking, if they put this uh, encampment right next to the sheriff, uh, I don't know how many of them would want to be there <laughs> to be under the uh, to be under the eye of the sheriff. Many of them may not want to. Uh, they may not want to do that. I, I think we have to get back to changing the language. You know, over the last 30 years, we changed the language. So we called, if you go back to the 1940s, there was hobos and tramps. We, some of us remember those terms, terrible terms, but they were still there. And now we have the term homeless. Well, what does homeless mean? It means the mentally ill. It means the addicted. It means that the person who's been put on the street because their husband threw them out of the house or, or she threw her husband out of the house, whatever, but they're without a place to sleep. And they're three totally different kinds of places. Or they're a senior who can't pay the rent anymore because Social Security doesn't pay for it. Right. You have children who ran away from home. You have yeah, teenagers. There's plenty of others. There's a lot of things, yeah. My point is that we shouldn't be having a one-term thing to <laughs> call it homelessness because it's not without homes. If you read the, the, the article that was produced by the Manhattan Institute that tells you clearly after 20 pages of reading a lot of stuff, <laughs> it says homelessness is not solved by producing homes. Homelessness is solved by creating a mental health clinic for somebody. Homelessness is solved by creating the, the re things to do those three particular categories, to deal with those categories. In any case, I've had my say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you John. We agreed on something. Yeah. We agreed on a lot of things. I think you're a small guy, and I'm hoping you think I'm a small guy. Um, is there anybody else in the room has any questions for Supervisor Heidel? Okay, and then uh, for our Zoom attendees, if you have a question you'd like to put forward, uh, go ahead and press the raise your hand button. I am not seeing any. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna move right along. And um, let's see, um, here we go. And that looks about right. So tonight we have uh, a couple of guest speakers. The first guest speaker tonight is uh, CJ Freeland and CJ is uh, an employee of the county and the county, uh, the Housing Community and Economic Development uh, Agency. And she's gonna provide um, a discussion and an update about the uh, county's uh, housing element update that it's a long process that we went through. And we, I think we talked either earlier this year, or we talked at the end of last year about the process and CJ's here tonight to uh, Go ahead and uh, give us an update. It's a, it, their their agency's done a lot of work. So CJ, if you're ready and you want to do a screen share, I'm going to turn this one off. Um, I will do a screen share. Just want to make sure I've got an audio check. Everything's good there. Looking good. Okay, let's do this share and see how far we can get. No, 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 no. <clears throat> All right. While I am getting this ready, um, let me first thank you for inviting me this evening. It was uh, sometime last year that we talked about the draft and where we were with uh, getting this project underway. It's been a multi-year effort and uh, it culminated on August 31st of this year with a, an adoption by the Board of Supervisors. Um, after that adoption, the housing element was submitted to the state of California, um, the Housing Community Development uh, Department, HCD. And so they have a 90 day review period to uh, confirm that the element itself is consistent with state law so they can give us a certification. And that certification is important to the county because uh, we need that in order to apply for uh, multiple um, grant funding for both transportation and for housing programs. 
So let's see if I can get this to work. So this wasn't a one man show or one woman show. We had a project team uh, that worked with us throughout this um, effort. Uh, we hired consultants from PlaceWorks. Um, Jennifer Gastelum was our project manager and Cynthia Walsh was the assistant project manager and um, helped carry much of this load. On the long range planning side uh, for the county, uh, Brett Sampson is our current program manager for long range planning. Uh, myself and Efren Sanchez, who is a senior planner with the department. We started the process back in 2018 with a resolution of intention because this is a general plan update. Um, it's important to note and something we emphasize often is that the housing element of the general plan is a land use and policy document. It does not address or analyze any specific housing projects. So we don't take in any of those specific projects into consideration. So we first submitted our draft housing element to the state on June 7th. Uh, they returned to us with some comments on uh, August 6th. We incorporated some response to those comments and also a lot of response to the public comment that we received um, into the adoption version or uh, what we'll call the adoption draft. We took it to the planning commission on August 17th and then immediately went to the board for the adoption hearing on August 31st. That date was really important to us because there was a, um, a deadline in statute that said if you if we didn't get our housing element adopted by September 10th, then the county would automatically be subjected to a four year update um, intervals instead of the eight year that we've been enjoying. Um, the reason that's important is number one, it's a, it's a giant project and there's lots of, uh, lots of work that goes into it. So it would have been a very expensive endeavor for the county to try to update this in a four year period rather than being able to wait for the next eight years. Again, after it was adopted, we submitted it to the state. We're receiving some comments back from them on the adopted draft that we anticipated. And I'll go into some of the reasons for that later and, and why we may see it back again. So the big project of the housing element is um, has is surrounded by the regional housing needs allocation. Um, we work with the Sacramento Area Council of Governments or SACOG. Um, and so El Dorado County is one of those um, members. There's six counties and an odd number of cities that are part of the SACOG region. The state allocates down to them a number of, based on population growth that the Department of Finance estimates for the state of California and then based on growth in areas, that number is allocated out to all the different uh, regions within the state of California. SACOG takes that number and then divides it amongst its members based on um, previous growth, based on um, population projections, and also based on um, availability of, of land. So the allocation that we received from SACOG for the um, Western slope of El Dorado County, and this is unincorporated areas, was 4,994 housing units. Now the Tahoe Basin was calculated differently, um, but it's still um, TRPA, um, the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency worked together with SACOG and the state. And so our allocation for that portion of the county, unincorporated area is 359 units. Once we get those numbers, those are then divided into different income categories. So as you can see, very low income, which is less than 50% of the area median income. We were allocated 1,350 units, 91 in Tahoe. For low income, which is 80% or less of AMI, 813 units and 55 in Tahoe for our moderate income. And that's between that 80% and 120% of area median income, basically often 
referred to as missing middle or middle income um, was 840 units or six and 63 in Tahoe. And then our above moderate income, which is anything above 120%, we were allocated 1,991 units. Now in the scheme of things and in the history of the county, we have not failed to meet our above moderate housing allocation. Uh, where we've struggled is in the very low income and in that moderate income as well. So we work with many nonprofit um, developers to provide housing for that low income and very low income, because that's typically funded by um, state grants and tax credits. Um, but that moderate income is a little harder to achieve because there aren't any funding programs for developers in that area. When we look at the variety of housing types in the county, it's no surprise that single family dominates uh, the landscape of the unincorporated area. When we look at um, smaller, and sometimes this, this housing model will translate into affordability as well. So only 2% of our housing stock in the county is, any, is two to four units. That would be anything like duplexes or fourplexes on a lot. When you look at five plus, that's what we consider or categorize our multifamily, usually apartments, condos, townhouses, that sort of thing. Only 4% of our inventory makes up that, um, that category. And then mobile homes, whether they're in mobile home parks or on private property, only make up 5% of the housing stock. So it's no surprise, again, that we have not failed to meet our above moderate um, housing allocations because that single family typically falls primarily in, in that category. We've been through this exercise before. I think we talked about this last year. The only thing that's changed is the income um, itself. Uh, the state recalculates the area median income annually um, and that's done by county. So these are probably based, do I have a thing? We don't have specific income levels on this, but overall about 37% of the households in the county fall into the lower income categories. Um, when we look at extremely low income, that's 30% and below of the area median income. That is a tough population to house. Um, it's typically, wages that are paid to food service workers, retail clerks, manicurists, home care aides. Um, if it's a single family income, um, housing is really a challenge. And the very low income, that 50% and below, those are wages earned by, these are just examples. Obviously it includes more can vary. Um, preschool teachers, bank tellers, security guards, uh, truck drivers, uh, medical assistants, and then in the low income, the 80% and below, um, those are wages primarily that we see for EMTs and paramedics, teachers, mail carriers, administrative assistants, <laughs> maintenance workers, and auto mechanics. Again, examples. Now, when you combine some of those um, wages within a single household, then obviously you're raising that household income a little bit higher. But again, Anybody trying to do um, a single income, certainly for single mothers or fathers or seniors, um, it, it can be a real challenge. So in order to uh, meet the state's criteria for the RENA allocation, they want to ensure that the county has appropriately zoned um, land that can accommodate the growth <laughs> for those um, housing units that have been allocated. So to do that um, analysis, we look at vacant lands, we look at underutilized lands, and that could mean there's a property that might still have a barn on it, or there might be a well house, or there might be something on it that makes the classification underutilized rather than vacant. Um, we look at infill potential. Um, also, we're able to look at mixed uses, that combination of commercial, residential, we look at the transit oriented potential, which is a little more difficult in our county because we don't have as distinctive transit centers uh, like many of the ur more urbanized areas have. And then we look at that realistic capacity. 
And that means what have we actually developed at what density? Um, are there other constraints on the land um, such as setbacks? Um, is there a stream? Are there slopes? You know, are there things that have an effect on the maximum development for those parcels? When we went through that exercise, we were able to identify a total of, now again, we're, now we're translating the units onto those properties. So when we look at those parcels and look at the parcel size, we're able to do a little math and calculate how many potential units can be provided on that parcel. And that's how we get to these numbers here. And again, they have to be sort of divided by income category because the second to the last line on this, the RENA um, 2001 through 2029, we have to be able to show that we have the capacity to at least meet our RENA allocation. And then where the county strives to be <clears throat> and current state law re doesn't require, but it's, it's prudent to have a surplus of units in each of those categories, because not every parcel is going to be developed in the way that we may have projected it would be over the next eight years. You know, we're looking at a crystal ball guess on our, based on the information that we have, the development um, patterns that we see and the trends that we're seeing um, for development. So at present, the county does have a surplus in all of those income categories. So we have a little wiggle room if some property or um, some parcel is not developed at its maximum capacity that we have um, projected. And that's really important because the um, state now has a law that's called no net loss. If you follow any of the housing news, the city of Huntington Beach was sued by the state of California because at a couple of years ago, they had done some rezoning for some development and they fell below the available parcels to accommodate their arena and they hadn't rezoned to replace that. So the state has a law in place that says you, you must maintain that capacity for your arena during the planning period. That's why that surplus becomes so important to us. The housing element, while it's the blueprint for the county's housing production and how we want to see growth in the county, it's becoming so um, legislatively dictated that one of the rare opportunities we still have to get in our local preferences and local programs that we want to address um, for, uh, for instance, homelessness or uh, that moderate housing that we wanna do, the workforce housing that we feel is important. We can implement those through the measures and programs of the housing element. <clears throat> so with that in mind, uh, we have 39 implementation measures in the housing element, 13 are in progress and rolled over. Those were ones that we had in the prior housing element that are that sort of thing that, you know, you want to keep going. That may be an analysis on an annual basis. So we want to continue to do those things. 17 of the um, previous measures were amended or revised, basically updated. And then we've added to date nine new measures. <clears throat> Some of those new measures are <laughs> the ecological um, preserve fee program update. That's the rare plant program that has a mitigation fee for development. Um, that is actually a fish and game federal requirement uh, that we mitigate and set aside preserves for um, the rare plants that exist in certain elevations of our county. Um, we added another measure to address the state density bonus law and changes that have occurred there. Um, we have strengthened and expanded our accessory dwelling unit um, programs. And um, we can talk about that more later, but we are going to the board this coming Tuesday on the 16th to adopt uh, amendments to the zoning code uh, to align with new state law on accessory dwelling units. We've also added a measure to address the large community care facilities, again, as uh, to get compliant with some of the recent laws that have passed. There's some new State Employee Housing Act uh, information, specifically with ag housing, 
that we've included into this housing element. And also we found we were deficient in defining exactly the single room occupancy units. Um, we do have a definition in the zoning code and other things, but it wasn't aligning with um, some of the other state programs. So we wanna make sure we get that cleanup done there. Some of the brand new measures, um, the county felt it important to promote middle income housing. And we're looking at that through our affordable housing ordinance project and um, other policies. Um, that affordable housing ordinance effort is now a measure in the housing element. Um, and that will include consideration of inclusionary housing. That was a strong suggestion by both the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors. Um, we added object, we, did, well, we didn't add, we memorialized the effort that we're taking on the objective design, design standards for community regions. And these are um, objective standards for both commercial and multifamily. And then again, basically to satisfy the state, it's in statute that the housing element is circulated to um, water purveyors. Uh, we've done that as a practice um, anyway, but we memorialize that as well through a measure in the housing element update. We also took a careful look at the public comment that we received um, on the public draft. Um, we held several workshops and um, had to pivot along with everybody else back in 2020 when many of our um, in-person meetings were suddenly canceled and we had to get really good at Zoom and other types of outreach. Um, but that was good because we got some really good participation that way. So we had a lot of comments on accessory dwelling units and, and uh, the need for that. Um, we had some questions on fair housing that are addressed in a very large section of the housing element update. Um, again, inclusionary housing that we're addressing through discussions and um, analysis in our affordable housing programs. Land trusts and other housing partners, um, the public comment was to uh, partner and uh, basically find a way of removing any obstacles that might help these organizations um, provide housing. Uh, mobile home parks had some specific issues on um, rent control, utilities, and other things that um, affect them on, on a wider basis. Again, those objective design standards, special needs housing and homelessness uh, were issues. And kind of at the last minute, we also um, had conversations about smoke-free multifamily uh, policies and, and um, basically policies. So we have uh, something in the housing element that looks at how that might pan out and what that would look like for the board to consider. <clears throat> then in addition to the public comment, we had those comments come back from the state um, after they got their draft review done um, in June. I think it said we got it back or August, early August. So we, these are things we added. Um, we had to do a deeper analysis of racially concentrated areas of influ, influ, affluence, sorry, affluence and of environmental conditions. Um, not because we have, <clears throat> not because we have them, but because we needed to expand that analysis. They wanted an expanded assessment of overcrowding, overpayment and housing conditions. Um, the same expansion for historic analysis of public investment and added analysis of moderate and above moderate um, income sites. There's probably more. Yes, there's another page. We had a lot of comments. They wanted us to determine that we had the appropriate density for multifamily. And this one kind of frustrates me because the regional default density is 30 units per acre on multifamily land. El Dorado County has done analysis and done the study and at 24 units per acre, um, we have been able to meet our RENA allocation. We've had discussions with developers over the years and included some of those more recent discussions in the um, housing element to support our position that 24 units per acre has been a sufficient density 
um, to provide for multifamily in our area. Um, the state's really pushing that we look at that differently, but when we give our analysis of the historical development, um, which is in the housing element, it looks at the different multifamily that's been done for that lower income, and none of them have ever been even close to 24 units per acre. So we're a little baffled by that, but, but again, if we want to get this um, housing element certified, there's some certain things we're going to have to add into our analysis. Um, infrastructure and water and sewer capacity. They wanted us to add some um, discussion on available water and sewer connections to the number of units needed for the arena. Um, we had provided some of that information and uh, needed to get more um, after the fact. So we're still um, preparing that for them. And look, they still have more. So they have questions on the accessory dwelling units and the capacity and how we're funding those. Um, we have, they wanted us to clarify some of the assumptions and strengthen the programs to promote, to promote this. Um, we're doing that through the house, through the accessory dwelling unit ordinance update. Um, there are some other programs that we currently have in progress that are addressing that. So we've made that clear and strengthened those conversations and uh, analysis within the housing element. Um, again, more, more analysis on the impact of fees and extractions and the schedule of actions within the planning period, uh, meaning they want to see how long it'll take to accomplish these things. So before we get to questions, let me tell you where we're at. Um, we've had another conversation with HCD based on the adopted housing element that we've submitted. As suspected, they continue to change the rules on their fair housing guidance. So they are asking for additional um, analysis and some more additional maps, uh, which we will do. Um, but when we went to the board in August, we told them, and I will tell you, that we anticipate in order to address HCD's comments that we will be coming back with an amendment to the um, housing element. But it was so, so, so important to have that adoption done before the September deadline that um, we felt it was prudent to do that and then to come back with amendments as necessary in order to get certification for the housing element. So I know that was a lot of information and I can get on my soapbox if you want to ask some questions. But <laughs> feel, feel free to, to open it up to questions and I'll try to answer where I can. Okay, well, uh, we're going to hit you full force here. John Resler has a, a question or more. Yes, or Cynthia. You, yes, sir. Uh, I noticed that um, you're putting 25 to 28 to 30 units per acre. Okay. And no, that's not I, correct. Wait, wait, no, let's, let's back I, up. I thought I saw that in the first, uh, for low income, 25 to 30 per acre. No, no, no. The, right. the, I just spoke Show about that. Show me I'm so wrong. You're wrong, but I'll tell you why. Um, but I understand how it could get confusing. The current density that the county has for multifamily is 24 units per acre maximum. We've never come close to that maximum. The state, however, has determined for the Sacramento region that 30 units per acre is a more desirable density. And we don't think we need that. So I, so right now we're at 24, we've never gotten that high, but the regional density is 30. So if, if you look around the country historically, cities that have tried to put that many people within a single acre have found that it is not sustainable. You can't put people with all those needs together in one area. They overload the schools, the hospitals, the, the uh, police with problems. That density is too high, okay? That's my first thing that I wanted to say. Second thing, the categories that you put people in that are low, very low and whatever, uh, you know, I was a teacher for 35 years. I don't consider myself a low-income worker. Uh, <laughs> I don't think anybody who's an EMT considers himself to be a low-income worker. I don't, I don't consider anyone who works in preschool to be considered a low-income worker. I don't know where you got these categories from. 
it's the numbers the state gives us. They determine what our um, what our area median income is for the county, and the state determines that spread. And then we look at that as an hourly wage, and then we go to our information that we get from EDD to show what the average wage is for certain occupations, and it comes from that. Well, they better go back and take a look at, at, at how they're classifying people. Yeah, I don't disagree. Yeah, but that's where we get it. And, and, oh, so I, and, on that, I'll... and on that density, just to address that, most jurisdictions that are doing that kind of density are in a more urbanized area. And frankly, they're doing it by height. So they're going up with that density rather than, you know. Yeah, vertical. Compact. Vertical. So they have, the, you know, it's a higher rise building. It's a you know, four or five story, six story building. And, and CJ, I think there is one exception in a multifamily category and that's our Eldorado Hills Town Center. And I think we are at 79. I, I thought it was 52 or something or other dwelling units breaker, but that's a it's five 40, story facility. 40. So that wasn't done on the- um, wasn't, wasn't done on affordable yeah. housing, but that's, that's right. the densest I know in Eldorado County, that's all. Yeah. I think you're right. And I think that's under a specific plan uh, it, it had to modify a specific plan, but yeah, it was a, so, it was a it had to modify the general, general plan, plan and the yeah. specific mm -hmm. plan. Yes, yeah. yes, you got it. So, got it. so that's how that can be done. Also, yep. for for lower income, um, we do have that density bonus, but it's uh, not been triggered at this point. It means that if a development, a affordable development, came in and wanted to do a little bit more than twenty four units per acre, there are provisions in the county code and the state law to allow for incremental additions, but it's never been exercised. We haven't gotten to that um, so density my request. My question, CJ, was that I know that you guys have done a lot of work on this and you have to do it every, it's every eight years, nine years? Eight years. Um, thanks. Uh, but uh, in comparison to some of our more compatible rural counties, um, you know, Placer has several cities, um, but we look at Amador or you know, Tuolumne, Cal Cal Calaveras, some of the closer rural counties, do they have the same challenges that we do? Uh, because their populations are similar or, or less than in many cases, Placer might be a little different, but do they have the same challenges with say, uh, you know, the, the, that density, the 24 units per acre, um, do, do they have the same challenges that you're aware of? can't say that I'm aware of their specific challenges having to do with density and and I haven't spoken with anybody from Amador County. Placer County hasn't had any trouble with it. Um, they have some programs that are locally funded and um, so they're able to do a little bit more creative planning than say we are. And then for most of those, for most areas, so if you're a municipality, you have to do your own, like the city of Plasheville, South Lake Tahoe. Mm -hmm. So exactly. they are doing sort of a, a parallel uh, effort because they have to meet those same standards that the county does. So, Correct. all right. And so is there any overlap between the county efforts and, the, and those two incorporated cities or is it completely independent? In terms of, I know Tahoe's not really, they have TARPA and in there, but uh, Plasterville with Sacog, I mean, there's something there, um, right? They're, they're really independent. So the city okay. of Plasterville has to do their own housing element, um, as well as the city of South Lake Tahoe. Where we overlap is that we have those other unincorporated areas in Tahoe, which we also share that TRPA overlay. Yeah. So. Okay, well then I'll go ahead in the room if there's any questions. Steve, you have a question? Um, back to your microphone. We should just pin it to you. <laughs> Good evening, CJ. Steve Ferry from El Dorado Hills. And I have been one of the people sending letters to you over the years <laughs> with the housing element. Uh, would you explain to the people here what inclusionary zoning actually means? Um, sure. Thanks, Steve. Nice to see you tonight. So inclusionary housing that we will be studying as a possible option. In basic terms, it means if a developer is putting in say 10 or more homes, then a certain percentage of those homes or units must be 
affordable to a certain income level, and the county has the option to determine that income level. The county also has an option to de determine what percentage would be required. And the county will also have the option to determine if an in lieu fee would be available for that developer to, to pay, similar to our Oak mitigation program. So there's a lot of different forms of inclusionary housing and we'll be bringing to the board a discussion of what some other jurisdictions have done. Um, some opportunities to look at are there specific areas that maybe a pilot program might be beneficial. Are there, um, there, there are a lot of options within inclusionary housing that need to be considered because it's not a, it's not a one size fits all. And it's certainly not a, an off the shelf program that you just plug in. It, it takes some discussion and, and you have to choose your options from a, a menu of possibilities. So just for confirmation, the Board of Supervisors will determine what the percentage of homes or apartments are going to be that are inclusionary. So if you're building 500 units, if they decide on 20%, you're gonna have 100 units of inclusionary zoned property that will be rented out at a below market interest rate for some, you know, whatever that number is, which will also be determined by the Board of Supervisors. Is that correct? That's, that's an example of one of the options. Not necessarily a rental, though. It could be a purchased home with a deed restriction. So mm -hmm. it depends on the community you're talking about. I, I did a project in Milpitas with 465 units, and they finally ended up in court to determine how to deal with the amazing deterioration of the homes that were supposed to be taken care of by the city of Milpitas and they weren't. And so the whole project tanked and it ended up in court to get it figured out. I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Yeah, and the a length of affordability would change too. Some, some jurisdictions have a, you know, they have to be affordable for 10 years. Some have them in perpetuity that it must be resold then to another income qualified um, buyer or usually see buyer also could be renter. Again, there's a lot of different possibilities, which is why we want to have a, a large discussion and workshop um, with the board for everyone to kind of chime in on, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We'll go around the room and see if anybody else has a question for CJ. And then if I don't see any hands, I don't. Um, I'm going to ask our Zoom attendees if you have a question for CJ, if you'll hit the raise hand button, I'll keep an eye out for you. And I don't see any right now, but CJ, I did have a question um, and it's been sort of a, a more prominent thing that, I'm, that I, I've been reading. Uh, it's more, it's in California, but um, development projects where they're primarily uh, rental housing, but they're, they're brand new single family home construction or duplexes or, and I know West Sacramento, they just, I cannot remember the developer, but West Sacramento has a project going in where it finally I want to say it was uh, Lewis communities here in, in the Northern California area, but is, has there been any discussion about how that changes maybe sort of the, I don't know if they're affordable or not affordable or if they're, you know, what metric they meet in there, but is there, was there any consideration that uh, that change in the, in the development market might assist in our, in our meeting our arena needs or, is that just not a consideration because we haven't seen it here yet? It wasn't a consideration in how we would approach our RENA allocations. Um, there's some other, you know, there's some other new developments coming along uh, that um, may, may influence a lot of things. I mean, the legislature change, changes something every year. Yeah. And every year they're taking more and more away of what, um, local jurisdictions can decide for themselves. Um, we're going to be doing an analysis on SB9 that is the urban lot split. And frankly, what I'm seeing is a lot of legislation that's enacted for urban areas, but it's not taking into consideration the rural communities and how we're supposed to adapt to those new provisions. And so it, it's been a challenge over the last several years that, uh, that we've seen this proliferation of legislation coming down. Yeah, and even in our even in our more urbanized areas in El Dorado County, they're not the typical urban uh, setting like a city, uh, uh, like a big city, you know, like Sacramento. Um, right. Yeah. So, well, okay. I don't see any more questions in the room, 
So I think you're getting away pretty easy here tonight. Wait, wait. Oh, wait, wait. oh, wait, John Ressler's pointing <laughs> oh, at me. I have one more question for you, sir. Okay. Uh, you almost Would, made it. Take, for example, town center housing. If the developer cannot rent that entire facility and he decides now to take in low-income people because the state will pay the rent, would that be inclusionary? Would that fall into your inclusionary uh, category? No, it would not. Why not? If they had, if they had built the project, when they built the project, if they had set aside a specific number of units for lower income because of the policy established by the county, then that would be inclusionary housing. Okay, thank you. At, yeah, at any time, a market rate um, unit can accept uh, a housing choice voucher or some other type of housing assistance to help someone afford that market rate unit. Uh -huh. And that wouldn't be that. Let me do a final plug, if you will. Sure. Please if there's do. No more questions. Um, next Tuesday, in front of the board, we'll be bringing that um, accessory dwelling unit ordinance. So, if you'd like to get some more information on that, tune in or come on down. Um, and then on December 14th, we'll be coming to the board with sort of a housing workshop to talk about some of the projects that we have um, already accomplished. More importantly, what we have in progress and then really having a discussion with the board on the priorities and the approach uh, that we're looking for in the next year through um, housing policies and, and efforts and you know, what, our, what our targets need to be. So that'll be happening on December 14th. It's a department item, so I don't have a time certain, but it's been, that particular agenda is gonna be full of a lot of housing related things. So that, that would be a good day to tune in if you're interested. Awesome. Good information. We appreciate you doing this for us tonight. We know, like everybody else, you're working all day and you're, you're staying up late for us tonight. So yeah. uh, <laughs> like last time, we appreciate the good information you bring to us, keeping us informed um, and educated sort of what the process is. So uh, sure, I'm hoping people are paying attention. And of course, the video will be available for everybody to watch. So okay. thank you again. Thank you so much for the invitation. Have a good night. No problem. Okay, with that, we appreciate uh, what CJ uh, did for us here tonight and sharing that good information. There we go. So we have another presentation tonight. And uh, let's see, I don't know where you want to be. If you want to come and sit down up here, if you want to be at that podium where you can point and put some authority, <laughs> however you want to do it. But I do have. Does that work? Does this work? It, it does work. You won't hear it in the room. You're a star now. And so uh, this goes forward, that goes backwards. And then the, back. okay, and the trigger is a green pointer. Okay, so I can't hear this. Um, how does the, can you guys hear me pretty well? Okay, just making sure. So if you'll pop up the presentation. And if you, is it going? Wow, oh, you guys have to yell at me. How about that? <laughs> All right. Just point at me if it's, oh, here you go. There we go, okay. So welcome to um, presentation from Pioneer Community Energy. Uh, we're gonna go through a lot of information. Once we've gone through it, we, we invite you to ask as many questions as you want and need. Um, basically, Pioneer Community Energy is community choice aggregation. So what does that mean? It means that the state gave us the authority, counties, cities, special jurisdictions to come together for the purpose of aggregating all of the utility load in their area and providing the generation. In 2010, we had one CCA, which was Marin Clean Energy, also known as MCE, and now we are at 24. So there is a movement afoot with this. Under the community choice aggregation, we have the power locally to buy the power, create the mix of power that we want. We have the ability to do programs and we have the ability to set our own rates. And that's all about generation. We'll get a little bit more into that. We're led by a board of directors, um, board of directors that are local officials. So our board right now is made up from uh, one official from each of the participating cities. That's Auburn, Colfax, Lincoln, Loomis, Placerville, and Rockland, and each of the counties, Placer County and El Dorado County. We also have um, regulatory oversight. It's more for the purpose of making sure that we're consistent with state policy from Public Utilities Commission, the Energy Commission and the California Air Resources Board. Okay, 
So a lot of folks have been asking us, what is the service area for Pioneer? So the blue represents up above, that's Placer County. The blue in El Dorado County is our service area. Basically, it's most of the Western Slope. We do not enter into the South Lake Tahoe area or the area that's served by Liberty Utilities. We're only in the area where PG&E serves electricity. And that's part of the um, agreement under the community choice aggregation. You can only be in the areas of investor-owned utilities. That's why you'll see over in the Placer side, that pink is Roseville Electric. We, um, by law, cannot enter into that area. And there's a little bit of smud over there. So that's what that is. So basically, if you're in Placerville or Eastern or uh, Western Eldorado County, you can be a Pioneer Community Energy customer. One of the other questions we've had a lot of is people going, well, how can you buy power from PG&E and make it cheaper? Well, that's not how the market works anymore. PG&E does own some of its generation, but the majority of the generation in the market now is by third parties, wind providers, solar providers, geothermal, Nextera, Calpine, Shell. There are a ton of different companies out there that are selling power onto the grid. So we go to that same market as PG&E under the direction and policy of our board and what the community wants and we buy the power. We use PG&E's lines and poles. We don't have a choice on that. They belong to PG&E. They maintain them. They own them. We are using them as a, in a, to deliver our power, uh, much like the other companies that are putting power out and they're selling them to others. That's what they use is that infrastructure. So PG&E delivers that power and then you use it in your home. PG&E is also by law our billing agent, and they also, when you're doing um, paying your bill, they're the ones who collect the payment and share with us. So you, you don't have any extra bills, it's just one bill, and you'll see us on it. So who we are. Pioneer is a community-owned electricity provider. The communities who own us, you are our, our owners in that you are a rate payer and you, will, you can go to your board and you can tell them what you want, you can tell them how you'd like the power handled. You will serve with competitive rates, you have choices and energy options. We're not for profit. That's a joint powers authority. Pioneer is a not for profit organization. We can make what it costs for our power and for programs, but profit's not part of it. That's part of what allows us to keep things um, uh, lower in cost. You can see we've got the, the counties of Placer and El Dorado in there. We've got the cities. Um, come January 22, 2022, that is, uh, Pioneer currently serves about 95, close to 94, 95,000 customers. When we merge with um, El Dorado County, it'll be about 160, depending on those who wants to participate. Okay, um, let me see. Pioneer um, partners to provide reliable energy solutions. And part of this is to make a positive impact locally. That includes securing generation that supports our goals. It also means procuring as much power locally as we can. Right now we have contracts with uh, Pelastro County Water Agency. We have them with El Dorado Irrigation District. We have them with Rio Bravo, Sierra uh, Pacific Industries, basically a lot of your local providers. We look for providing competitive and stable rates. At this point in time, uh, Pioneer has not changed its base rates since 2019, October. So it's almost two years now. Um, we contribute to the local economy. Pioneer is tries wherever possible to buy local, spend local. So that means if we need services for janitorial or printing or pens, we look to buy as local as possible. We look to buy power as close as possible and then to fill our needs regionally, statewide, and then out of state from there. Um, part of our goals is to meet or exceed the greenhouse gas and renewable energy requirements, depending on the cost of the power. It has to be reasonable. A lot of those renewables can be expensive right now. Um, we're also developing um, community-driven uh, programs. Our community programs advisory committee just met today for the first time. It is a board of, or a committee of 11 individuals, five from El Dorado County, six from Placer County. And they get together and they're gonna be looking at guiding the Pioneer Board on the types of programs, which means as a community, you can come to that committee and say, I'd like rebate programs. I want programs to help seniors. I want programs for weatherization. I want whatever it is that you want. Electric vehicle charging stations. You bring those forward and you guide what those programs are. Part of the local component. Let me see. There we go. So um, 
a lot of questions come up as to why Placer County started this. And we did it in 2017, started serving load in 2018. And this is the reason. A lot of it is a desire to have as much influence as we can over keeping utility rates reasonable and influencing and, and providing economic stimulus. So from February 2018 to November 2020, these are the stats. We saved our communities $32.5 million. That doesn't mean it was refunded. It means that money never left their pocket. So residents had about $93 a year in savings, but you can see small business and large business actually had more. So that's money that stayed with those businesses. That's money that they could reinvest or use as they needed. One of the other things we do when we talk about local control, you can drive what kind of program and Pioneer Green 100 is a program that was developed out of a survey with customers who expressed their interest in having a 100% renewable product. So what does that mean? It means that the resources in that product are all renewable. Hydro, geothermal, could be biomass. In this case right now, it's running at 100% hydroelectric. Customers who wanted to have green power can choose to opt up to that. It's a choice to make. It's totally voluntary. It's not required. And it's about uh, one cent more per kilowatt hour. So basically for $7 a month, you can have 100% renewable power if that's what you want. Some people don't want it, but there was a contingent that did. We have over 120 people on it, a mixture of businesses and residents who started using that. So that's another one. Let's see if we can get that to go. There we go. Okay, a lot of questions come up about solar. Pioneer and solar. Actually, Community Choice Aggregation and Pioneer work well with solar. There are some differences. Um, at this point in time, we've got about 20,000 solar customers on a per capita ratio basis. Pioneer actually has the highest concentration of solar customers. Um, there is some differences. We do pay a half cent more for net surplus compensation. For those who don't have solar, it means after 12 months, we go through in March, April and look at everybody and see, did you generate more than you used? If you generated more, those extra kilowatt hours um, get a uh, rate of half cent above PG&E's rate and we pay you out. So in uh, 2020, um, we pay, well, 2020, we did about 175,000. 2021, we did about 187,000 for customers. Um, the other thing that makes us different is we bill on a monthly basis. It's not a true up as much as just a reconciliation. So instead of having one big bill at the end of a year, you have a little bit of a bill throughout the year. You, if you are what they call you're making more energy than you use. You get a credit at the retail rate and that goes on to your bill as a credit and you just keep building that up each month, it rolls forward. And when you stop generating as much as you use, then you start taking away from that credit and just kind of balances out. That's how it works. So let's see, there we go. So one of the other things that Pioneer does is a lot of advocacy. We stand up for our customers. Okay, so we talked about 3.5 million in discretionary spending that we invested in the communities. In the River Fire, which was in Colfax, I know you guys had the Calder. In Placer County, we had the River Fire. It took out about 100 homes. Um, we've been able to, at the direction of the board, waive the bills for those customers for July and August, just no charges. But, you know, people who've, got, who've lost their homes really shouldn't be facing dealing with a utility bill when the home, they've got other issues bigger than that. We have AB 843. This is a special bill that opened up funding for biomass. The program already existed. The money was already there, but it was not being used very efficiently by the investor and utilities. So community choice aggregators said, well, why can't we bring that program local? Why can't we invest here? Why can't we have access to that? Doesn't cost anything anymore because it's already allocated but let us take advantage of it. And so AB843 um, AB actually passed unanimously, which was something that uh, Pioneer not only sponsored the bill, but the uh, primary witness was our Sam Kang, who is our, our power expert. Mobile home parks, there was legislation that Pioneer pushed for, and we led the way on to ensure that mobile home park residents get the same benefits as the master meter for their mobile home park, and as all the other, um, constituents and customers of Pioneer Community Energy, there was a loophole, a conflict between 
Public Utilities Code, Government Code, um, the Business and Professions Code, and it was being exploited to the detriment of the mobile home park uh, residents. And so we pushed for legislation and got it, put that through. Ag com um, customers, we did some work with some time of use stuff that was going on and basically um, by pushing for this change, saved some of our agricultural folks between 465 dollars and $14,000 a year. So we did some of that. Public safety power shutoffs. Like we said, we don't own the grid. We don't have power over it you know, being turned off, when, you know, no control there. But what we do have is the ability to advocate for reasonable application of that program. And that's what Pioneer has done. We've been the lead for all of the community choice aggregators, not only on public safety power shutoff, but now we're stepping up for the new program, the enhanced power shut off, power safety shut off, the EPSS program, or otherwise known as fast trips. So um, we've been working on that one as well. We also have an arrearage management program, which is for anybody who's on the CARE, um, California Alternative Rates for Energy, or FARA, Family Electric Rate Assistance Programs. It allows them if they've got back debt from um, utilities from COVID to have uh, make a payment and then have a certain percentage of their back debt waived. And so we have that going on. So next step is enrollment. Right now, we are starting the process. El Dorado County is slated for enrollment January, 2022. That starts with notices going out in November, more notices in December, enrollment in January, additional notices in February, and more room, uh, notices in February uh, or March. Basically, from this point forward, you can make a choice. You can stay with Pioneer, or you can be with pg &E. You have a choice. You don't have to make the choice immediate. You can actually take your time and look at things, see how the bills work before you do it. <coughs> Please forgive me, I've got a tickle. Um, Customers can also, you can, you have this option from now forward. So it, there's no deadline, there's no absolute. There are just some things that change once you get to uh, March. But at that point, you get a one-year commitment. Yes, I have a word. I want to insert myself here and let Alexia try to read a little bit. Um, my name is Mark, just so anybody knows. Just a couple things. First off, I'll figure this out on the fly. But... Um, one of the couple of things I wanted to comment on in the advocacy slide, which was two slides ago, that's a big piece of what we do for our customers. And we've been advocating on behalf of El Dorado County for a number of months now, whether it be the PSPSs or the fast trips. And, and the benefit is, is not a matter, we don't say, well, you're not a customer of ours. We're not gonna advocate on your behalf. And it's not, well, if you're a member and you're not, you don't get the benefits. It's, it's a regional issue that we do, the fast trips, which Alexia kind of glossed over. We heard about those from uh, the folks in Georgetown. We were up there doing a community meeting and they started sharing with us these so-called fast trips. And it was actually, we led the effort with the other Cal CCA uh, agencies and President Batcher ended up sending a rather not friendly letter to PG&E and she's been calling them out. And, and I'm proud to say that we help them in that direction so we're a believer in advocating for the rights of our customers and our residents and our businesses whether you're a pioneer customer or you just live in our community because we are a member of this community and so that's one of the things that i'm very proud about as far as we do so going on to this slide here um, these are the timelines of the notices you'll see we have some the first wave goes out in november the second wave goes out in december and the first one says, hey, we're coming. You've got 60 days and you're going to roll over sometime in January. The next one is, right, we're on our way. December is it's coming up close. And then enrollment begins in January. And basically enrollment is whenever your meter read takes effect, at that point, you transition to Pioneer for your next month. That way you pay a full month pg &E, and then you automatically enroll in Pioneer. Then after that, in February, we say, hey, you're now a Pioneer customer. Welcome to the family. And then 60 days later, you're going to get another notice that says, hey, you're still part of the family. Thanks a lot for being a, a customer of ours. And then at that point in time, if you've opted out, that's where we say, okay, now not we, that's where the state and PGE says, now you've opted out and now you're committed. And that's, the, that's why we keep telling our customers and the folks in El Dorado County to wait. If you're not sure about this, hold off and wait. Don't make decision. When you get that November notice, you can call up when you get that November notice and say, I want to opt out. 
unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, it depends on how you look at it, pg and already announced what they called significant rate increases coming in, in January. We don't know what those numbers are, but when they send letters out to their customers, as I've been a longtime pg and customer too, they never say significant rate increases. And so when they do that, it's going to be big. And so if I tell customers, I know Lexi does too, if rates are your number one concern, hold off and wait. You're going to get the notices. That's requirements by the state of how we notify you. You do not have to opt out at any certain time. You can opt out whenever you'd like. But if you opt out after the 60 days post enrollment, you will be committed for 12 months. So what we tell people is not only is the rate increase going to be significant, the PCIA, which is the exit fee, is expected to drop. And we've heard various numbers, but the best thing to do again is if you wait, you contact us directly in January, around the January time frame, and we'll do the analysis with you. We'll get your bills, we'll pull them up, and we'll walk you through and say, if you stay with pg e you're going to pay X. If you become a Pioneer customer, you're going to pay Y. And then you can make the informed decision that whatever's best for you, your family, your business, whatever it is. We just want to make sure that you have the right information to make an accurate decision. The big thing is if you opt out after the 60 day notice, you'll be committing to pg e for 12 months. And that could be potentially costly, literally, it could cost you money. So again, we kind of just want to lead with that there. Oops, I just pointed the laser beam at you there. I'm sorry. I'm guilty. <laughs> okay, so for NEM customers, um, those are the solo customers. One of the things to watch for is if you have a true up in January, February, you'll be rolling with everyone else January, February. If you are March, April, May, June, July, August, you will get your notices at different times. Your enrollment date will be, if you're March, April, your enrollment's March. If you're May, June, your enrollment's May. Your first notice, if you look at that, will be for the March folks, you'll get your notice in January. For the May folks, you'll get it in March. So for solar folks, you have a choice. You can come in early. Otherwise, you have to wait around your true up. And part of the reason we do that is those true ups are really valuable and we don't want to disrupt them. So that's kind of why we're holding off on the enrollment that way. Um, you, you can go early if you'd like. You can always call us and say, is this going to be okay or not? You know, what's it going to look like? And we'll help you do the analysis. Okay. So how does billing work? There are basically two parts of your bills. As bundled customers, you'll hear that term, bundled and unbundled. A bundled customer means that you get both your transmission and distribution, your lines and poles, and your electricity from the same provider. So you guys have been bundled customers all of this time with pg &E. If you come with Pioneer, it becomes unbundled. pg &E has the lines and poles, Pioneer has the generation. That means on your billing, you'll actually start to see what the costs really are for transmission and electricity you'll find that about 70% of the bill is transmission and distribution, lines and poles. Electricity is around 30%. Okay, so this is really, this is what it looks like. It's kind of an example. If you have a Pioneer, um, on, if you are a Pioneer customer, page three for normal, um, them has a different one. So solar customers, you see different um, page numbering, but for the standard customer, page three would be your electric delivery charges. And page four would you be your Pioneer Community Energy. There are a couple of things we have highlighted there. We'll be showing you another slide with some of that information. It's generation credit. That's what you would have paid pg &E. The big thing though is right down there, that little circle. Right now it says 2017 vintage. El Dorado County's 2021 vintage. It's a little messy, but basically what it is is when your county or city decides to leave and the implementation plan is filed, that becomes your vintage year. That exit fee changes for each vintage year. And each year, pg &E publishes from 2009 through the current year what the costs are for the exit fee for each vintage. So if you are a, an El Dorado County customer and you're looking at the Placer County vintage, that's not the correct one for you. It's actually, woo, where did it go? In the middle, I did it again. It again? There you okay. go. Woo. All right, oh, there we go. Yay. Okay, so this is more like what something would look like with um, El Dorado County. And it's also why we've been holding off. 
folks have been asking us, what's it going to look like? How much are we going to save? What, you know, right now it looks like we pay more. Well, actually, we got the numbers just this week filed by PG&E, some information about what the PCI is most likely going to look like. Now, this is using the current generation, not the increase, just what they're charging right now. And the 2021 vintage, if you are a uh, Pioneer customer, you would have paid $64.22 for electricity. Under PG&E, you'd pay 60, is that 68, 69, 69. Monthly savings about $5, about 7%. That's right now. Remember January 1, PG&E's generation rate goes up. So that difference between what you save is going to expand because Pioneer has not got plans right now for any addition. You want to talk? No, this is the one thing I wanted to say here with this example, this is just a, a random residential customer. So the actual savings will vary greatly based on how much you use at your house. The idea here is the 7% for a residential customer is a good number. But again, give us a call and we'll pull your exact bills and make a look at it. Just, I just don't want you all looking at the dollar figures and go, boy, that's what I'm going to save because you could use twice that and save twice the amount. So. So, and it will vary by your rate class as well. So business, um, agriculture, things like that. We encourage you, you know, we're available. Call us, ask. We'll help you figure it out, look at everything. So the next question, we've had a lot of folks going on. Well, all right, if you're not cheaper, which looks like we're going to be cheaper, why else would I want Pioneer? Well, here's some of the things. With Pioneer, you have local control. pg e is actually responsible to 940 million share. They're, it's an investor in utility, so their obligation is to their stockholders. We're not for profit. Um, according to one of the third party providers that monitors utility profits, um, the net income for PG&E at June 2021 was 814 million. We answer to ratepayers. We answer to you. You are the ones guiding everything. Uh, PG&E actually has to be careful with what they do because Wall Street governs their stock price. Local staff, we're in Rockland. We live in, some of us live in Auburn. Some of us live in El Dorado Hills. We are here. We are in your community. We're your neighbors, your friends. Um, we meet with people in person, on the phone, through Zoom, but we are local. You can come to the office and, and visit us if you need. We have public board meetings. They are all governed by the uh, Brown Act. They are open, they are publicized. You can make public comments. You can comment on the agenda items. PG&E's board um, meetings are private. I, I can't even find out when they're held or where. Stable and competitive rates. Like I said, we have not changed our rates since October of 2019. If you've tracked PG, which we do, because you know, they're PG&E and we're in their service area. They've actually have an average of about four rate increases a year. And it might change on which one it is, but they do make changes multiple times a year. We invested uh, 32.5 million in the community. And, you know, PG&E has over 5.5 million customers. We have Placer County in El Dorado. So we're focused on the local. We're focused on our neighborhoods and our people. Okay. This is our contact information. So... You have the 800 number, it's toll free, and you can get a lot of basic questions answered there. If you want deeper dive, you can always ask to talk to the Rockland staff, and you put my name out there, Mark's name. Um, customer service email, you can always ch send a note that way. We respond, we um, put information on our uh, website and also on our Facebook page. Uh, Mr. Davies has been very, very kind to share the links to these meetings. So we post them so folks can see the meetings. And if you can't, you know, someone couldn't attend, let them know it's available. And if they have questions, they can just call and we'll answer those questions. So with that, sir, we open it up. I get the first question, Steve. You're gonna have to wait. Um, so as an example for the solar customer, and I am one, my true up is in August. Mm -hmm. So I'm towards the end of the year, but I, if I wanted to, uh -huh. I could call and jump early. Yes, you okay. could call and enroll in January. Now, okay. word of warning to solar customers, whenever you make a change, rate, meter, ad panels, change provider, go to Pioneer, it will trigger a true up. That's why yeah. we don't push all of the solar customers early on in one bunch. So as long as you're okay yeah. with that, make well, the choices right. For I'm you. aware of how painful a true up can be sometimes with everyone 
at home going to college and to high school and working and working. And um, so your usage goes up. Um, so I'm, a, I'm aware what the true up looks like in bad years. And so there might be an advantage for someone if they talk to you to determine, hey, you know, you can make that initial true up a little less painful based on the, like if you're after June or July right. to, towards this new period, um, or maybe you do need to wait and look and yeah. see. It might, it might be your usage might be enough to justify just holding still until it's time. Exactly, so okay. for solar customers, if you have questions, we've gone over bills with folks and, and helped do an analysis. What does it look like if you are on, with Pioneer and PG&E, what is it if you're just with PG&E because they have the annual true up? And we've done a lot of those analysis to make folks comfortable. <laughs> Because sometimes for certain people, especially on the older grandfathered rates, the NEM1 and the E6, sometimes staying there is better. And we want to make sure that everyone's making the decision that's right for them that way. So um, the other advice we're going to give to solar customers right now is um, under direction of the Public Utilities Commission, PDG was ordered to do this, NEM customers over the past year have been transitioned from the E, if they were on an E1 or a flat rate with tiers, they were pushed on a time of use. And if you didn't make a decision, then you've been put on that. And so do a rate analysis and see if you're still on the best rate. We found a couple of folks who on solar didn't know they were changed rates and suddenly had their bills go crazy. So just make sure you're checking your rate analysis on that one. Steve, your hand went up first. We have multiple presentations. Are you, we're going to get this link. This is recording right now. The the um, the one you did the other day, um, I got from the county, and it's posted on the community council section of our YouTube channel right now. So we will post this one as well. And so we'll post the link on our website as well. We have other meetings that have been posted, but if you would like, we can certainly email you the link directly, or you can you can go onto the website and certainly share it. Yeah, the the PowerPoint. If you email customer service, or you know, if you get if you get my card today, or just email them and say, "Hey, Alexi said she'd send me the PowerPoint," we'll send it on to you. It's public information, so yes, if you want it, we distribute it. Oh, I'm I'm certain there's got to be some more questions in this room. Okay, I'm going to hand you this microphone, sir. People listening, here you go. Okay. You just hold the how how is the solar uh, credit um, accounted for? Right from from my solar goes back into the transmission line. Does pg e track it? Do you track it? How's pg e tracks it. So they, because they own the meters, they track it and they report it to us. And so if during the day you generate more electricity than you use and it gets onto there, it's credited at the retail rate for that time period it was generated. That goes on your bill as a credit. We reconcile that month. If you've generated more than you used, that credit stays on the bill and it rolls forward each month until such time that you need to use the credit. Theoretically, if you produce exactly as much as you use, you have a zero true up. Basically. At the end of the year. Yes, okay. that's what you, yeah. Okay. And, and that shows now, if you are a net zero uh, producer like that, we'd ask you to work with us because we wanna make sure that you pay absolutely nothing. So sometimes there's some tricky parts in there in the winter time and which program you're with can be, can shift a little bit. So we're happy to do an analysis and show you where it's at and what you know, if you would pay or not pay. And then you make the choice from there. How is this going to impact the transmission fees that PG&E charges since they're selling less power? They've got to make their revenue somehow. So it looks. Okay. So they don't. Okay. Um, let's start with that. 1977 conservation was put in place in, class, in uh, the state of California. They bisected production and generation from transmission distribution because you can't have orders to conserve if that's where somebody makes their, their profits. So they set generation aside. So we want to have that profits are made on the transmission and distribution. In addition, it is um, part of the rules and law. pg &E can't charge a different rate for transmission and distribution for any of the other customers. Everybody pays the same thing. So if it all goes, if they, if they say we're raising distribution rates, they're raising them for everybody. If they say they're raising transmission rates, they're raising them for everybody. We all are pg &E customers for lines and poles, and that's where their main profits come from. So we don't, we actually don't take anything away. That keeps their line people going, that gas you know, readers going, that's with the gas lines, they get their, their money there. So that keeps going that way. 
Um, let's see, I think, I guess that's all I've got. No, yeah, we'll that's, back, yeah, okay. okay. Is anybody else with any questions? We back here. Does anybody remember Phil Donahue? Because this is what that feels like. <laughs> Get a question about the PCIA. Uh, I'm confused because I heard um, some other conversations where we're going to go on the 2020 vintage rate, but then now you say, is this new vintage rate going to apply to us in 2022? This okay. Week? So what happens is, like I said, when, when you leave, um, El Dorado County voted in 2020 to become part of Pioneer. And so the implementation plan was put in place and that set your vintage year as 2021. So from this point forward, as long as you're with Pioneer, or your VA if you go with direct access, your vintage year will be 2021 and pg e will calculate that rate each year and put, publish it in a tariff. So okay. that's how that works. So Placer County, most of our people are 2017. Folks who decided to come on later are 2018. And there were some late developments with solar customers in 2019. Okay, but that reduced rate you showed us on that slide as an example, that's the 2021 rate? That is the 2021. Okay. Yes. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Okay. Well, that's now 2021 at the current 2021. That will shift in January. And so you'll have the new 2021 and you'll have the increased PGE rates. So you'll, those, all of those numbers will shift and that will again show you what your savings is. But for right now, that's where it's at. So okay. what you're talking about with the, uh, the PC, with the, what she was trying to talk about with the annual. So Eldorado County is vintage year 21, which is where they had the basis set for the exit fees. They recalculate that in 22, and then in 23, and 24. So every year, it, as she was saying, it's a really convoluted system that they've come up with, but it's what's been accepted. So on the one column, you're looking and going, what vintage year am I? Right. And then you got to go across to the actual calendar year and say, in this year, I'm going to pay X. And then in January, hopefully, if they do what they're supposed to do, they recalculate for that year. And so in 2022, January, we're going to find out what the new the exit fee is for Eldorado County being a vintage 21. And then 20, in January 23, they reevaluate and recalculate it and come out with a different number. If you look at, as Alexia said, this, this list is from 2009 to today. So all across the state of California, all these communities have joined CCAs are on different time frames. One of the big risks right now are we're seeing a lot of people are going onto our website and they're grabbing the Placer County information, which your El Dorado County Vintage 21, the exit fee today is like 2.8 cents. In Placer County, it's like 4.5. So if you're grabbing the Placer County data accidentally, that's going to make it a, a, a losing venture versus a winning venture for you as far as financial you know, savings goes. And so it's real important that, you know, that's why we make ourselves available. We want to make sure that you all are aware of the accurate information. And then again, when they change it, they post it to the website and say, well, it's your responsibility to go find it. Good luck. I mean, I've tried to find this stuff on their website. It's insane. So we put it on our website to hopefully help you guys not have to dig through hundreds or thousands of pages of information at PG&E and you can just grab it. But again, to your point, it's 21 vintage, but then every year that number is going to be modified by PG&E. Which okay. is part of the reason why we couldn't give anyone absolute numbers starting back in October or September. We had to wait till PG&E filed its paperwork in November. It'll go before the Public Utilities Commission in December, and then it takes effect in January. That's why we kept saying we're going to have to hold, we're going to have to see. For folks in Placer County, we've got great news. PCIA is dropping. It's not going to be four, four cents. It's going to be closer to two, which... Okay, so let me explain what PCIA is. All right. Power charge and difference adjustment is legacy costs for power contracts that were purchased on everyone's behalf long ago. That would be 2005, 2010, 2015. Some of these are long-term, they're 10 years, 20, 25. Those, when you leave PG&E, those are called stranded because you're no longer paying for those. And the, and the Public Utilities Commission said, well, that's not really fair. They bought these contracts with you in mind. Now you're not there anymore. You should pay your fair share. No one will argue that, that makes sense. What happens though is the PCIA has been twisted a little bit 
or a lot, depending on how you look at it. And other things have been thrown in there. And so each year, these things that get thrown in there adjust whether it's a cent per kilowatt hour or two cents a kilowatt hour. And it's an adder for Pioneer customers. For PG&E customers, it's embedded. It, and along those lines, that's another example of the advocacy and the fighting that the CCAs are doing. So statewide, the CCAs are going to the PUC saying, we want to understand the numbers that are behind the four cents, the two cents, the three cents, whatever it is. And, and that information, again, we're a public agency. All that information is public. It's out there for everybody to see. They're a private corporation and that information is not available. So the CCAs are challenging the, the math that goes into that because it appears that some of these costs are in the gray area, shall we say. But anyways, that's just what, another continued fight that we're having with our customers. For okay. our customers. With Did you purchase long-term energy contracts yes. too? And so what happens if half the county opts out? I mean, will you guys be holding the we bag? We hold on to those and we have to adjust our rates accordingly. But right oh. now, the Pioneer rates are 30% below PG&E's just generation. Yeah, AKC I saw it. Yeah. is an adder that right. goes straight to PG&E. So if you look generation to generation rate, theirs is about 11 cents right now and ours is 7 cents. Will El Dorado County be hit with charges? Um, if they, exit, if they exit out of Pioneer, county, like yeah, let's say everybody opts out with that. No. Well, that, the county's not going to, there's, there's, there's some things out on the web about that. For buying yeah. power. Yeah. The closer you get to the day you're delivering power, the more power you have under contract. But the further out you go, you leave wiggle room, room for price drops, price changes, new technologies, new projects coming on. So you, you closer you get, you're going to have it further out. So if you guys go through and say, yeah, we're, none of us are going to do it. Well, then we just back off that late procurement and stay with what we have. Okay. And energy and electricity is so an open market across the United States. So if we had a, a pile of unused electricity, they would turn around and sell that on the open market to recover costs. We have a gentleman and his employees, that's what they do. I mean, it's way too, it's way more complicated than I want to get involved in, but they, they're buying and selling on the open market based on need. And that's that's what every utility does and every CCS. Yes, yeah. you also go through and you do things like hedge. So hedging means that you look at what the forecast looks like and how the market's going, and you buy contracts to ensure that your prices aren't going, you know, skyrocketing up and then plummeting down. You try and level it out so that customers don't experience rate shock, they don't experience volatility. That's part of what we try and do. This is my last question, but um Thank you, John, for <laughs> being patient there. But yeah, I just wanted to also ask about um, the uh, 60 days, the first 60 days. Now, is that, is someone, can someone opt out and then um, are, they, are they tied to the one year period so still works, at the, in the first 60 really days? Messy. So starting from November to March, right. you, can, you, can change, you can leave Pioneer and then come back later. After the March 2022, March 30th, Right. 31st. It's one year. I always get that one confused. <laughs> uh, after that last day in March, basically you go back to PG&E. PG&E requires that you stay with them for a year. That's for right. market stability and, and power purchasing stability. So at that point, you're kind of locked into it. Prior to that, you can have a little wiggle room. With Pioneer, you can leave at any time. So if you decide you want to leave in November, okay. Um, you actually, from that six, because of that 60 days, you could return sooner. But the process takes a little while and you have to wait a full billing cycle because of how the, the transition with PGE works. But that's how that, that 60 days after enrollment works. Is it's the, you know, it's kind of like the the opportunity of, oh no, I I, I didn't want to do this, or oh no, I I want to stay. It's that chance for you to kind of take a look at it and evaluate it. So because rates are gonna shift in January, because there's going to be a potential for some good savings, if that is what your focus is. Let us be with you January. Look at your February bill and then make your choice. You can opt out at that point. No harm, no foul, no worries. Yeah. And if you're solar, okay. you don't have to worry about your grandfathered rate. If you're on a, a CARE, FARA, medical baseline, it's not a problem. If you are on a time of use rate or, an, or, or what's called a close rate, you stay on those. We don't affect any of that. So okay. there's no, there is no penalty or there's no exit fee from us. There's no charge that we cost for going back to PG&E. It's not there. Thank you. Yeah, that's, I just, my neighbors asked me, I just want to make sure I, I said, you might want to try this thing out, but I'm, I guess I was 
think that was good advice that I gave them. So, okay, great, thank you. So are there any more questions in the room? Oh, wait, I'm gonna go behind you first. <laughs> I just wanted to know, so when we get these notices, are we getting forms to fill out, to no. send in? We don't have to do anything if we don't want to opt out. You just, yeah, if you if you want to stay with Pioneer, just let it ride. You know, get the next notice, toss it out, you're done. If you want to opt out, you can do it online or by phone and you can take care of it that way. So this program was designed by the state as an opt out because they wanted to ensure that if a county or a city took this on, that they didn't cherry pick customers and they didn't cherry pick communities. We take everyone or we take no one. So it's a democratic approach and it's for fairness. But once you're scheduled for enrollment, the choice is entirely yours. Whatever you want to do, stay or go. It's just, if you want to go, they make it that you give us a call or hit it online. Do these notices come through you or through pg &E? They come through us. We direct mail them to everybody. Um, we'll also be combining it with those who have chosen to have, um, if you've got e-bill and you've chosen to have electronic communications, then we'll go through and you'll get them by email. But the first set's being mailed to everybody. Hopefully, as long as your address is correct with PG. I, I just haven't heard much about this, and I just happen to see it in the Mount Democrat. I haven't mm -hmm. got any notice on anything yet. No, that's because the notices are um, required under law to come out 60 days before, 30 days before enrollment, six, 30 days after, 60 days after. We have had a number of community meetings. We've had um, presentations to the board. We've had uh, presentations to this community. Um, we've had them at the Community Services District. We put out press releases. We've worked with the chambers. We presented to them. So we've, we've been putting out information. It's just, but it's not getting to us. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you, and that's a real challenge. I, we don't know how else to do it. I, I mean, we've done every venue. How about through, through PG&E? <laughs> PG&E won't allow us to put any inserts in the bill. Is that interesting? No, I, just, they're, my, they're right. My last question is back on uh, the true up. Yeah. Uh, during the winter, I use more than I produce, so I'm going to be getting a bill that will be due? It would just be for the electricity, but yes. So if you're one of those ones, like I said, who walks that line of almost zero, we need to look at it because there would be times when you might pay and times when you'd have credit. And if you have enough credits to get you through the winter, great. If you don't, we want to make sure that to see if the annual works better for you than a monthly with Pioneer. And so, you know, just let us know because there's folks who are going to be using more power just consistently. They know it and they're just kind of tear shaving or doing you know, just trying to reduce their load, they're going to do okay with Pioneer. But when you get to the net zero or the net surplus compensation, it can walk a little bit each way. And so we like to help folks make the best choice for them. I've actually had two people we've said, stay with the annual. It's going to be better. So that'd be more the true up system. More, that, more of the annual true up because you have, because you only have one or two months when you'd actually right. pay something. And so, you know, we try and be real careful with that because we want folks to make the right decision for themselves. Yeah. So are you saying we have a choice whether we want a monthly or an annual Is that what you're saying? Are you saying we have a choice between an annual and a monthly true up for the uh, electric generation portion? You can, if you're with Pioneer for the. What, for what I'm getting, an annual true up today. I don't customer? know if that's electric generation yeah. or what. Yeah. Are you a solar customer? Yes. Okay. So right well, now, you're annual. People that get okay, through so us. annually, you go through and pg &E goes, here, here's your bill. Boom, this is what you owe. With Pioneer, you'd still have the transmission distribution annual from pg &E, but but you have the electric generation with Pioneer, and that would be the part that would, would be reconciled each month. So again, if you're a solar customer and you're not sure which one's best, we're happy to go over the analysis and help you figure out which way are you gonna save the most. Go ahead and ask. You might. <laughs> I think my question is the same as your first one about the ten dollar a month. I call it the privilege of being on the grid. That is exactly fee. what that fee is. Okay, so I've been paying the same thing within fifty cents for seven years. Mm -hmm. Is that going to change? The the transmission distribution portion, the which is ten dollars a month. month. <laughs> um, at this point, no. Come March, under new P PUC rules, I can't say what it's going to be, but that process of paying that $10 a month will not change. That'll be your credit. If that's all you do and you're within 50 cents at your true up, 
talk to us because we want to make sure you're on the weather. No, my right. true up's higher, but okay. but that ten dollars a yes. month has not changed for a, no, no, you know many no. years. And, that, and Pioneer has no impact on that whatsoever. Okay, that that fee covers the grid connection and the meter reading and the billing. That all goes into that process. Yeah. And so that's a minimum component provided to PG&E. All the investor and utilities have a minimum charge for solar customers to cover the administrative yeah, costs. Yeah. yeah, I'm not complaining about it. I yeah. just, yeah. Um, it, it I don't want to get away from that and then go back and it's $20, no. you the, know? The, <laughs> yeah, unless the NEM program at the state has changed, it, whether you're with us or them, okay. Back yeah. and forth, it doesn't matter. And then the my other question was about the California climate credit. Everybody gets it. Okay, no it doesn't change. Doesn't matter. Yeah, if you're with Roseville Electric, you get it. Okay. Smud gets it. We get it. They, everybody gets okay. it. So yeah, that doesn't change anything, and the amount doesn't change. Okay, it's the same for everyone. Well, first of all, I got this in my what I call junk mail yesterday. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else that's that's the that notice. First notice. Is that your notice? That's, that's our first notice. notice. First notice. Okay. Well, it now, didn't get mailed to her. It just came. It didn't in get mailed mail. to me. It no, it, it's got her address on it. It does her name. Oh, it does. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. It just so, and so everyone knows. Um, if you'll show it up for the folks here, and I know um, those of you who are so online might not see it, but it's an eight and a half by eleven, two sided. On the front side, time to talk about the program. On the back side is all the terms and conditions that the Public Utilities Commission requires us right. to tell you. Right. They, they suggested we put that on a six by 11 card and we went, yeah, people are gonna need a microscope to see what the language is, not happening. So we went with a larger format to make it easier. But all of the terms, conditions, obligation, payments, opt out, everything is on, those, on that second page. My point is someone may miss it because yeah. it looks like it was included like with my Safeway and Safe Mart papers as opposed to my actual mail. <laughs> I, I can't help that. That I know actually went out with it. That goes through the US Post Office and what they stick it with, Just I so, can't control. I mean, that was a bulk mailer, but it is so probably. Exactly, yeah. and because yeah. of its size, it was probably it's put that way. Yes, yes. but it's, it's a flat rate, yeah. Well, my question's a little bit different. We just had three Tesla batteries installed uh -huh. through a special program with PG&E. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not have solar yet. We probably will next year. The whole point was to provide us um, power during PSPS. loss of power. Yeah, okay. the PSPS program. Mm -hmm. However, we are able to um, we are able to program mm -hmm. through Tesla uh, buying our energy from PG&E at a lower rate, six a.m., uh, twelve midnight, six a.m., and then I could actually program to use my batteries. Yeah. Uh, so that I'm paying at a lower rate. So How is that a, going to affect me with Pioneer? So I'm, you're on a time of use rate then? I am. The time of use rate will stay. The programming will stay. It's just whether you're paying P Pioneer or PG&E for that actual electricity. Okay. That's the only difference. We don't affect those programs. We don't affect batteries that anyone's gotten from PG&E for the PSPS events. So we have no impact on those at all. It's just, um, you might look at our, our rates. The, we even model the exact same times. So there's no crazy for customers going, well, wait a minute, pg has this one and Pioneer has that. No, no, we don't do that. It's okay. everybody's the same. We follow their model. Right. That way, make it easy okay. for time of use. So that's, you have the same time of use then that PG&E has. Yes. Okay. So the rate schedules pg e has, we will also carry. Okay. Recommendation to everybody, if you haven't done it at least once a year, go to pg .com slash rate analysis and see if you're on the best rate. pg is adding rates all the time. The Public Utilities Commission is changing things all the time. You may or may not be on the best rate. So it's always good to check it once a year and see if you are because you can save money. And we encourage you to save money every place you can. So. Oh. Oh. No, no, we got to get you on the microphone. Okay, cool. For the, for the pe people online. And the reason why it's important for people online to hear this is because I've been like three or four of these meetings. I get new information every time that I didn't think to ask. So I'm glad you're asking. Now, I, I, I may have read this incorrectly, but I, there's Valley Clean Energies and Services Davis, and they have this bid to buy PG&E lines and poles, I think. 
is that something pioneers thinking about? I mean, to, to, so we can get. Guess... Um, let me, let me, okay, that's <laughs> municipalization. And Yolo County tried that and it didn't go very far. PGE didn't want to sell. San yeah, Francisco tried it. And PGE said, ha ha ha, no. Nevada Irrigation District put a bid on some lines and PGE said, nope, not happening. That is a very specific asset. That's where they make their profit. And PGE is not letting go of those assets. Pioneer is not looking at buying lines and poles because PG is not selling them. That's that is their grid. The state could, the PUC could, but right now, pioneers, you know, what we have authority over is generation. That's where we're putting our focus. Because I I'm hear that sometimes uh, the selling point for CCAs is to that they're going to they can do this. Uh, you know, they could, you know, but. I guess it's not too likely right now, maybe yeah. it's a- uh, it's... No, What CCAs can do yeah. is reflect the programs and interests of their community. So if you go to the Bay Area, yeah. you will find communities that are 100% renewable. Everybody's on 100% renewable. Right. They have a um, higher percentage of renewables in their portfolio. Some of them have EV programs that they put a lot of focus in. Um, others, you have Pioneer. Our focus is competitive, stable rates. So that's what we focus on in community programs to help our our community and invest locally. Right. So we're looking at biomass and things along those lines. So that's how the, the difference is between the communities. That's what community choice aggregation provides is that yeah. direct kind of control over what we're doing, where we're buying yeah. from on those things. I'm sorry, I thought of one more thing, but um, how does Pioneer invest in the communities? Uh, how, what type, what's an ex some examples? Of well, we had that, Oop, well, we don't have that up anymore. Well, I mean, yes. the, the specific things. I'm, okay, like, so. We have, um, we buy power locally. So Rio Bravo is in Lincoln. Seattle Pacific Industries is in Lincoln. Placer County Water Agency is, of course, Placer County, or, um, El Dorado Irrigation District is in El Dorado. Right. We put contracts in place with them for buying power. That keeps money coming into their program. That keeps, uh, you know, we get good rates. They have money coming in from those sales of contracts. That keeps people in hired. So that's buying power. Then we have our um, investment in what we buy. We have local staff. We have a local office we rent. We buy supplies locally. Every time I bid out for one of those notices, I go to local printers, El Dorado, Placer County printers, who can do the job. I offer that up that way. Janitorial services. We're looking for janitor, janitorial services that come from Placer and El Dorado County. Buy local sell local, contract local is a real big component of what we do. And that's where the investment comes. Discretionary dollars are invested in our community. Okay. Top of that, but, uh, yeah. in our RFP process, in our, our, our RFP process, we actually award points for being a local vendor. So a local vendor sure. gets a few extra points just for being a, a local vendor. Sure. I mean, call a 5% uh, preference point. What it means is that if a local vendor is within 5% of low bid and the low bid is not another local vendor, we can award up to them and that way keep the money in our community, keep local folks employed. One of the other areas that we're looking at is the public purpose programs charge. is not a lovely name. Everybody pays into it. It's where the money for medical baseline, the money for care fair comes from. A lot of the public programs come out of that paid uh, through everybody paying for it and it's divvied out. As a utility, we have the ability to apply for those funds and bring them in locally. Right now, we don't have the numbers for El Dorado County, but when we did initial studies in Placer County, we found that Placer County put about five, six million dollars into that program and $250,000 came back to our community because it was aggregated and distributed in the urban areas versus coming back to the community where it was generated. Well, we have the ability to reach out, pull that money back and put it back in the community to the people who put it there in the first place. So we can look at programs and funding and things along those lines. We can look at grants. We can team up with our local municipalities. We can team up with our conservation districts. We can team up with a biomass developer and as the third party that takes the power out of a project, help site power that's local jobs, local generation looks for things to support us during PSPS events because if the problem's a transmission line and it starts here and it cuts off here but we can position it further up and keep the communities higher up powered up good thing so we look at those kinds of opportunities to leverage um, requirements mandates where we can to help the communities meet some of their needs and goals sure. that make sense oh yeah and so it's reinvesting in local businesses and power generation here 
okay. wherever possible, yep. as much as possible. Gotcha. So we, but we can only buy what's available. So if it's not available, okay. you know, we're kind of we have to move out from there. But we start local. Um, last year, twenty, we, uh, my report for twenty twenty showed forty two percent of that three point five million that we had in discretionary funds was spent in Placer County. Now we have El Dorado County, so we can hopefully increase the amount that's spent local in our service area. Okay, great. Thank you. And you're looking at other communities to move into to expand to. So what happens there is repeat your question for the okay. yeah. So the question was, is Pioneer looking at other communities to expand into? Yeah. Actually, what happens is we get approached by other communities and ask, would we come and talk to them about possibly having them join our agency? If I, if um, a county, my folks live in Nevada County, so I'm just gonna use Nevada County. If Nevada County came to us and said, hey, we'd like to join Pioneer, it's at the direction of the board. We have actually a subcommittee of board members that actually do the research and determine if it's a good fit for us, because we wanna make sure what Alexia was talking about. If this community wants 100% renewable, they want everybody to have an electric vehicle, but that's not the model of the rest of the foothills, and that's not the model of the rest of the agencies that we're that are members right now it may not be a good fit for us so is it, is it a good fit for them but also is it a good fit for us and our customers and that's why the board looks at it and says well my community is interested in this and our goal is this this agency over here wants to go down another path maybe it's not a good fit so uh, in in the two months that i've been i've only been at this organization two months even though i've been here 20 some odd years in the industry i've been to five community meetings where people are interested or agencies are interested in researching joining pioneer so we're very popular and, and people like what we're doing and, and it's just a matter of is it is it the right fit so. but hey. are we actively going out and recruiting no that's not that you know the, the communities approach us el dorado county did a whole well, bunch we're of always research. aware of the advantages of expansion but it's got to be the right Absolutely. fit so we're, we're not uh, begging people to join let's yeah. put it that way and what, what it has to be a community it has to be motivated for it so if they want it and it's their desire then we'll meet with them but we're not going to go out and sell them on something because we need to spend our effort taking care of who we're working with now and if so, someone else wants to know about it we're happy to present to them but so we yeah. are uh we're hitting our time limit here. Okay. Uh, the fire department is very kind to us in letting us use this room, but we do have um, one community member. Uh, it's John, I cannot see your last name. It's M-A-R-C. Uh, I'm gonna say it's Marcinizic. Yes, I can't see Oh, wow, because I can't see the end of it. So uh, John, if you'd go ahead, uh, we're ready to uh, hear your question. My question is just, I, I came from the state of Maine where they separated transmission from power generation uh, several years ago. And one of the things that I saw was there was always an option to pick from three or four different power generators. And my question is more towards you. Will, will that be the model in the future or has that been considered? I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see this separation of uh, power generators from, from line management. Uh, I was hoping that this would happen years ago in California. Yeah. Okay, so in California, I mean, you're the, the kind of what you're describing is something that's similar to Texas, where you can rotate providers and move around and, and change and, and do contracts. California is a little bit more controlled in how they approach power procurement and the management of the grid. So they're not going to wild west it and have like a whole bunch of providers out there. Because right now, I mean, let's let's face it, when you do telecommunications, how many different companies are out there trying to get you to, to use their cellular lines and things? Um, California, because the grid needs to be balanced and because the California Independent Systems Operator has some specific requirements and the Public Utilities Commission has requirements, they have not, um, while it's been deregulated, they have not opened it like that to additional providers. Right now, depending this is on- why your my size, question was directed not towards your company, but towards the, right. the supervisor. And towards the state, yeah. California hasn't decided to do that. You do have, right now, there are three options. If you are a um, in an investor in utility, you can go with um, a community choice aggregator if it's available. You can go with your investor owned utility, or if you are a commercial customer, you can get direct access. But that's about as much as available right now, and the direct access is actually limited to a lottery. So that's what they have. If you are in a municipally owned utility district, um, like Smud or Roseville, they are your provider, and you you don't have other options. That's the way it's, it runs. Awesome. Well, thank you for your question, John. Thank you for sticking with us. So with that, 
think we've got some good questions. Oh, oh, two things I'd like to add. Number one, um, Pioneer was just a recipient of award. It was put out by Find Energy, where they were declared the lowest residential electric rate provider in 2020 of all the the CA, CCA power utility companies. So Actually for the state of California. For the state of California, excuse me, state of California. So that is significant because that's what the organization is all about is keeping the rates low. That was the number one criteria it started with and that's continuing. But we do recognize there's reasons why you would take exception to that for local gener power generation, other things, but never at a significant increase in cost. It always has to be maintained but it's not just the lowest cost available anymore, but clearly the award tells us we're headed down that path very well. The second thing I'll advise you, if you haven't purchased solar, I would be cautious because I just read announcements saying that the PUC is considering making all excess energy that goes into the grid free. So if you over specify your solar, if you over generate, thinking you're gonna get true up and stuff, PUC has the ability to say, well, no, we're not going to pay you anymore for that. Thank you very much. Evidently, that's what this is saying. Yeah, that's the NEM 3. We watched these proceedings. That's the NEM 3 proceeding, and it would be taking effect in March, depending on how they come out with the decision. So there's been a lot of battle over that one. So we'll have more. Well, hopefully it doesn't go that way. It's your power. You should be able to get money for it, right? If we don't know that it's going to change old contracts, so if you're a NEM 2 or a NEM 1, there's going to be a certain period of time where that won't apply to you. But what the rest of it means, we're waiting for the Public Utilities Commission to come out with their decision and tell us how they're going to rock everyone's world. Well, one of the things that Pioneer will certainly do for you guys is we're monitoring that and we're going to make that information available. And we'll try to put it in simple English so our customers will be able to read that on our website. Or if you have a situation, again, call us and say, what does this mean for my, my usage? When it comes to solar and excess production, you know, batteries are an option. Now, those are not cheap. Right. Don't get me wrong, but it is an option. So it's not like you have to send that energy back and say, oh, I'm just going to throw it away. Right. You can store it. You can look at a battery as a potential option. But we want to be part of the solution and part of the resources that you utilize when you're looking at those. Well, I just wrote, sent an email to Kylie today about this thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that? While PG&E might no longer pay us for our excess power, Pioneer would? Pioneer still has its net surplus compensation. So at this point in time, we've been given no direction. Otherwise, we're watching what that decision says. But at this point in time, we have no plans to change what we're doing. So you don't know is the answer until until, until that decision comes out, what it tells us. Well, utilities. Utilities. If, if the PUC passes it, yeah. they're going right. to pass something just to watch. Right. So right. if they pass it and... and We'll let everybody know what it means and what it's going to look like. And the board will then, they have the right to do whatever they need, they want to do. So we can bring it to them and say, tell us, how do you want to go? What do the constituents want? What do our customers want? And we'll look at that. Well, what so, we want is to get paid for our excess power. I, yeah. I can tell you that. Right? I, I, I agree with you on that. Right. It's very possible. It's very possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I, I'd like to thank you both for being here tonight. It's an important conversation to have because it's it's imminent and pressing. We have a couple more things to wrap up with, but I'd like to thank you guys. And if you'd like to go home, that's fine. Um, I am going to go home. One thing I do want to tell all you all before you leave, Mr. Heidel's on our board, and he is one of our greatest champions. So make sure you thank him whenever you guys get a chance because without him, our board would be you know, lacking a very strong board in the So I thank you, and I know our whole organization does, and you guys you can send it. And John, thank you for oh. having us back multiple times. Nope, no problem. Come, so um, I'm going to wrap up here with a couple comments about uh, some housekeeping. Um, our APAC uh, projects that we've been looking at, um, this is just a quick uh, summation of where these projects are at. We're not going to talk about them too much tonight. Town and Country Village, it's a pre-app that was presented to the Board of Supervisors in October. Uh, two oh, yeah. hotels. Um, generally at uh, Bass Lake Road and Country Club, um, so about 1,200 units of housing. It could go up or down. Some other elements, mixed use. Um, the board seemed generally receptive to it. Uh, they've been very kind with their time and made uh, several presentations to APAC to keep us updated about what they're looking for or what they're exploring doing. So uh, expect more on that. I know that the, the major concerns that the board expressed at both Supervisor Heidel and Supervisor Turnboo was about traffic and circulation. I believe uh, Supervisor Parlin had some concerns about the type of project, but here we go. So uh, the next one, of course, is Central Elder Hill specific plan. 
Uh, Commissioner Vegna has mentioned that he expects it back for the Planning Commission sometime in early two, uh, 2022. Um, there's some concerns or some discussion about level of service um, for the circulation element, um, but it's not the VMT, the vehicle miles traveled, which is the uh, CEQA requirement. So there should be no recirculation of the, D, uh, the draft EIR again. Um, the Costco project, we had heard uh, from uh, county staff, they expect uh, sometimes closer to summer 2022 for the draft environmental impact report or something. Uh, there's no detail yet, but they're still working on uh, this with the uh, project applicant. Uh, Creekside Village specific plan is a little different. Um, uh, they had talked to us uh, several times over the last, since 2018 about this process and it's 288 acres at the end of the business park off of Latrobe. Um, the last update was the comment period closed for the draft environmental impact report in December, 2020. Um, at that time they were just discussing 926 units on 208 acres. However, uh, in the interim, um, they uh, looked to, uh, to uh, provide some land to the Eldorado Hills Community Services District for uh, 50 plus acres of park or other CSD usage. So that plan was 926 units on their marketing website because we haven't heard back from them recently. They're now talking about 800 units. It was 208 acres, now it's 188 acres. And uh, there's, uh, we're still looking for the uh, draft environmental impact report to come out. Uh, Carson Creek Village, uh, 600, 800 dwelling units on 98 acres at uh, Golden Twiddle Parkway at Carson Crossing right against Latrobe Road. They uh, did present to us here at APAC uh, and they're very generous with their time as well. Uh, their last update that public that we've seen is uh, their, their J6 pre-application presentation to the board in February of this year. Um, we're almost there. So these are two unusual ones at the end here, just to raise awareness so the community knows about it. There's a cannabis conditional use permit application in for Norcana, uh, Norcana I guess, uh, commercial cannabis distribution delivery. It's in the business park, Robert J. Matthews Parkway, um, in between both ends of Hill, Hillsdale Circle. And then of course Latrobe Road is on the other side of uh, the area there. there uh, there is a school with a conditional use permit in there, a private school, and there is a uh, church back there. But um, APAC is probably not gonna look at this. Uh, this is new to the county. So um, we'll, we'll find out as uh, this comes, I'm sure it's more of a, uh, a ministerial type of an effort to review this project. Um, it's conditional use permit. Uh, business park is probably where you'd wanna see that as opposed to anyplace else. Uh, the very last thing in terms of John, projects, John, can you just, do you have the exact address for that? I can give it to you. It's, it's, it's on the APAC website. Okay, thanks. I'll, I can get it, everybody. Um, this is an unusual one too. It's Lakeside Boat and Storage, RV Storage. It's in, it's in, it's um, all enclosed RV and boat storage. And it's on a parcel just um, off of Sophia Parkway um, off of Green Valley Road. And it originally, uh, we saw a, a pre-app a couple years ago or a year and a half ago for a senior care facility. It was like three or four stories. And so now this is a different use proposed. I uh, don't know how far along this is. Uh, they have not responded to our questions, but it's uh, right behind or adjacent to the uh, El Dorado Hills EDH Folsom uh, uh, self-storage yard that was approved um, a year and a half ago. So, um, and the only other thing on our agenda tonight is to let you know that our, uh, our slate for our officer election next, next month in December for a December meeting, uh, our current officers are going to continue along. Uh, I'm very grateful for their uh, commitment to serve and help the community. That said, I know that uh, a lot of us have done this for a while and we'd like some help. So um, in this coming year, if you're a voting member of APAC, or if you're becoming a voting member of APAC by working on a project, We'd love to see somebody step up. Um, there's nothing that says we can have more vice chairs or if you want to be chair, I'm keen on that as well. So, um, but we will have our election next month. And um, if that's the only thing we have on our agenda, we'll probably do it virtually so that Mike doesn't have to stay here all night. <laughs> so with that, our next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, December 8th, 7 p.m. start time, like always. And again, if it's just our officer election, we'll do it virtually. If um, you know, if three projects come up with some significant developments, we'll probably seek to in, uh, impinge on the, uh, the courtesy of the fire department again to meet here in this building. So with that said, I'd like to thank the people left in the room tonight, all the people who stuck with us online through the uh, virtual meeting. Um, you know, the, 
participating in this, it's all volunteers and even attending the meetings and listening, you're providing some support to the volunteer effort by becoming educated and uh, being aware of proposed development projects here in the community. I would also encourage anybody, if you happen to go to the APAC website, sign up for our mailing list and you'll get our monthly agenda mailed to you once a month unless there's something dire and then we'll send you a supplemental email. With that, there's nobody here to argue with me. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you everyone for being here tonight.